Thank you. Hi, everybody can hear me? All right. Uh, once again, it's wonderful to see everybody here. A lot of friends. How many people have been here every time? How many people is the first time? Nice. All right. How many newlyweds? Yes. Oh, two. <laughs> Woo. Yeah. That, that's awesome. Uh, all right. Um, before I get started, you know, there's been a lot of controversy about what we're working on and how much we're working on it and roadmaps. And um, I hope it's evident to everyone this week uh, what we've been working on. Uh, it's our fashion sense. <laughs> and uh, and um, I'm happy to announce tonight with the caveat that, you know, things can change. And also that, you know, this is completely up to me. Uh, but the roadmap, the five-year roadmap for closure is going to be stripes. <laughs> and uh, because I know you've seen enough of my purple shirt. Uh, but, uh, and, and if we get enough time to work on it, and again, no guarantees. Uh, we've done some experimental work already, but we may work on scarves. Okay. Actually, uh, we have been working on a ton of stuff, and it is mostly getting spoken about at the conj, but the thing we didn't quite get out in time for conj was 110. But it represents a ton of work, and in particular, it represents a ton of work by someone who is not getting to speak, who you just heard speak, but I would really like to hear a super uh, recognition for the work of Alex Miller. All right, maybe not. Uh, so yeah, um, it's tricky uh, working at the bottom of everybody else's stuff, being a language designer and working on languages. And uh, it is something that anyone who does it takes very seriously. And it's super stressful because you just don't want to make mistakes. Uh, but you know they happen, and so. Let's talk somewhat about end dollar mistakes. So we're going to start with this quote from Tony Hoare, who said uh, that null references uh, were his billion dollar mistake. They led to all kinds of uh, exploits in languages like C uh, and things like that down the line. And of course, they still exist, and we still have nulls, although we have Java's memory system, which makes them not necessarily exploit vectors, but certainly still things we're not happy to see at runtime, null pointer errors or whatnot. Um, but, uh, and, there were, and there were many reasons why you might have put null references in a language back when he did that had nothing to do with design intention or user intention. You know, things like it was easy to implement or it's efficient to implement or they didn't have another idea. Uh, and in this talk, what I want to talk about is uh, the fact that we still use things like this. We still have the desire to say that something is optional and whether we use nulls or some other thing in our programming languages, this is still an idea. This idea of maybe not needing information in a certain context. Uh, so when do we do it and why? Right? Well, the first is that we might uh, optionally require something. It's like, you could give me this or not. If you give it to me, maybe I'll have an extended set of features I provide, uh, but I don't, I don't need it. So this has been an argument to my function I might not need. And of course, if you've got no variadic args and you have a fixed number of slots and some have to be optional, um, you're going to have to put your optional thing as one of the types of the args. Or you know, if you're using something like spec, you're going to have to say that there. Now, we do that less often enclosure because we have a couple of other ways to accommodate optionality. For instance, we have variadics, so you can just not pass me those extra args. I'll put them on the end, and I'll have different overloads of, uh, of arity. 
and that's how you can get them. Or you can say the optional args are keyword args. And that's another way to do that that doesn't have you having uh, a nominal thing, which is a nullable, nullable, optional, maybe kind of thing in there. But that's a place, uh, certainly argument lists are, you know, kind of product types. They have places in them, the first argument, the second argument, or whatnot. When you have places, you have to put things in places, right? Another re place where we use optionality is in returns. Um, I'm going to go try to find that thing for you, and if I find it, I will return it, and if I can't find it, I'll return null, didn't find it, some other kind of thing. So you might or might not, I might or might not provide something to you. That's in the return value spot. And pretty much there we are, we do the null thing. And we have nil punning and everything else because we're still having the nil party in the lists. Uh, and then the core of this talk is going to be about the third context, which I think is particularly interesting and very challenging, which is how do you manage partial information in aggregates? So I'm going to give you a collection of stuff or a bunch of things that have a name associated with the bunch and then names within the bunch. And maybe in certain contexts, I want to or need to see them coming towards me, or I will or will not give you them as a provision. Uh, we do not, in Clojure, tend to do this using nulls, right? We don't put a key in our map and put nil in as the value there. Uh, and I'm going to talk a lot about, or not a lot, I'm going to talk about the differences there. So this is the context, right? How do we represent optionality in programs? So of course, you know, nils were bad, so other people fix them for us. And we are, you know, Philistines for not yet using this. Uh, and there's a couple, I mean, there are many floating around. This is not like there's one answer. There are many answers. So probably they aren't all the best. Uh, but in Haskell, we have a type called, or there is a type called maybe. It's a parameterized type, right? Maybe of some type A. And it has two constructors. You can have just an A, or you can have nothing, which is our nil. Um, and then Scala uses a lot of things to, <laughs> to make that same kind of thing-ish, somewhat. Um, so I think we'll stick with the Haskell version moving forward. Um, the, and, you know, you will hear this said, oh, this is the way, you know, this is a way to do this. This fixes the problem. What's great about it is it forces you to check, right? And, of course, that is the most important thing in programming, that somebody is watching you and making sure you're checking for nils, no matter what the cost. Right? And the problem is no one can articulate the costs. No one ever mentions costs. This all benefit, right? but it is not. Okay? So when do you see the costs of maybe? You see them in program maintenance. All right? So yesterday I had a function. It took an x and return to y. People wrote code to that function, right? Today, I'm like, you know what? I was asking too much of you. I actually can get by without that x. I'm now making it optional, right? This is an easing of requirements. An easing of requirements should be a compatible change, I think. Uh, so we make this change. We say foo now takes a maybe x. This is the way you represent optionality. And returns a y. And the compiler inside foo will make sure that the code in foo doesn't accidentally fail to consider nothing. Right? Woo! That's all win. Except what? This breaks existing callers. Right? This is a breaking change. It should be a compatible change, but it's a breaking change. Let's talk about providing a stronger return type. Okay, so yesterday, I wasn't sure if I could do the job in all cases. I wasn't sure I could provide a meaningful return value, so I took an X and I returned a maybe Y. Uh, but today, I figured out how to give you an answer in all cases. Um, and so, because when I was giving you that maybe Y, you had to deal with it, I want future callers to uh, have more certainty about what they're getting. So I want to make a compatible change of strengthening my promise. Okay, so relaxing a requirement 
is, should be a compatible change. Strengthening a promise should be a compatible change. So I do this, I change, I said, I'm definitely gonna give you a why. Guess what happened? I broke all of my callers, again. I broke my callers, right? Because now they, they have code that deals with maybe and they're not getting a maybe anymore. So what is happening here? Right, what's happening is that maybe and either, in spite of their names and the play on language in English, uh, are not actually type systems or no matter how many blog posts from people that just learned Scala you read and Haskell that you read. This is not or. Right? This is an evidence of a type system that does not have or for types, does not have union types. And you're trying to fix it in the user space. Right? And guess what? You can't fix it in the user space. Right? Uh, either in particular, uh, wow, it is just not a beautiful thing. It does not mean or. Right? It's got a left and a right. It should have been called left-right thingy. Because you know, then you'd have a better sense of the true semantics. There are no semantics, right, except what you superimpose uh, on top of it. And using English words to try to, like, give you some impression is not good, especially in this case where you're so failing to g come close to or. Right? It has none of the mathematical properties. It's not associative. It's not commutative. And it's not symmetric. Right? Actually, better than left-right thingy would be sinister dexter thingy. Because right, at least you'd have some sense of how it treats left. It's quite poorly. Um, so, you know, I have a reputation for bashing type systems, and I am not. I'm bashing maybe in either. Okay? But, you know, other type systems have other answers to the same questions. Right? Here's Kotlin. Kotlin has nullable and non null types. Right, so if you say string, it's assignable from a string. That's pretty good. Uh, but if you try to assign null to it, it says compilation error. So they've strengthened the reference types in Kotlin. They've said, you know what? Null is not an okay value of all reference types. Even though Java, JVM allows you to have a null as a value of string, um, we're not going to allow it in the surface language of Kotlin, even though it compiles to bytecode. But you can have string question mark, and question mark is the way you, you know, add nullability to a type. And it creates a proper union. All the strings end null as a type, right? Because types are sets. So it's all the strings that that set and one more thing. And then it's assignable from both, right? You can assign it from ABC and you can assign it from null. If you made the same changes I just described in Kotlin, you would not break callers, subject to how Kotlin links and I don't know how Kotlin links. Uh, Dottie, the successor to Scala uh, that the Ordersky team is working on uh, has union types uh, in their plan. And it says of union types, this union types are the dual of intersection types. Values of type A, I'm gonna say or, because I think it matches. Values of type A or B are all values of type A and all values of type B and all values of type B. That set, it's set union. Right, or is commutative, A or B is the same type as B or A. I think this is awesome. I have never used a type system where I haven't desperately wanted this. So it can be different. Do not get lectured to by people about maybe and either. They are not the best answers in type system world. Um, so let's get to the harder problems, right? First of all, well actually, let's talk about closures versions of those things. Obviously, we're dynamically typed, so we don't get into the are you doing the right thing game until we add spec. Right? But once we add spec, we're exactly in the same place. We're trying to uh, enforce in testing right, the same kinds of things. Are you making sure you're dealing with what, you're, what you expect? Are people passing you what you expect? Are you returning what they expect? You know, are you providing and requiring? Um, and so we have Spec nullable, which is an, an analogy to the Kotlin nullable. And we have spec or, which is, again, just straight or. Of course, our types are just sort of predicative sets, right? You have a predicate. Things that satisfy that predicate you know, constitute a set. And that's or is unions of those sets. And it has all the same properties you want uh, for or. 
That's why we're allowed to call it war. Uh, so let's talk about the hard problem. The hard problem is this partial information problem, right? So here we're talking about providing or supplying aggregates. So in closure, we would be talking about uh, sending around maps, okay? In object-oriented languages, you'd be talking about sending around objects, instances of classes. You might have a language that has record types. Could be that, or it could be, um, you know, Haskell style. Uh, uh, types. Of course, you know, of course we have our definition, uh, aggregate. And the thing that's cool, more secrets of giving talks, is that um, it seems like I know all this Latin stuff, but what happens is I look it up and I see this great definition and I'm like, oh my goodness. I mean, we've, we've known it all along. Like our languages embed essential concepts. And so when I looked up aggregate, I discovered that gregare, which is the same root as gregarious, uh, it means flock or herd. And flocks or herds mean animals that travel together. This is a beautiful notion. It's exactly the right notion that I need for this talk, <laughs> right? Which is that we're trying to talk about information flow in programs, and we're trying to say we're creating these sort of um, ad hoc, willy-nilly, you know, aggregations for the purpose of, of a particular communication. We're gathering a set of fields, right, sets of information, things we know, and we're passing them around. It's going to travel together. Uh, so the notion of aggregates, I think, is super important, and, uh, and the notion of an aggregate being a herd is really beautiful. So we, so we want to stick to that. Even, no matter how you make aggregations in your programs, you're doing the same thing. You're trying to name your herds, right? your flocks. Uh, so now we get to sort of a fundamental difference right? in how you model this. Right? It's sets versus slots. Right? In closure, we use maps. Right? That's fundamentally sets of keys and the things to which uh, that they're associated. Uh, in languages with records and whatnot, uh, you're dealing with slots. Of course, you can already tell which one is better. <laughs> uh, so let's talk about maps. Um, I think I find it really interesting because you know people look at maps and our use of maps and they're like, this is just you being lazy, blah, 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 blah. But you know what? The thing is, uh, Russ Olson just gave a talk and he was trying to talk about functional programming to people who you know, were just trying it. He talked about mathematical functions and their, the fact that they're essentially, they're mappings, right, but they're essentially abstract. And in programming, we only get mappings via code. That is not true, actually. We have an even more primitive way to get from a mapping of one set to another. And it is the literal map. It is saying, if you give me this, I will give you that. If you give me this other thing, I'll give you this other thing. If you give me this third thing, I'll give you this third thing. I'm saying specifically, declaratively, with no executable code, no functions being run, nothing, a definition of a function, a, a mathematical function, right? a mapping between a set and another set. It's a concrete thing. It is the best function in programming because it's the easiest one to understand, right? It should be a function. It should be something that you can call, right, if it's a function. And we can call these, right? <laughs> we do this all day long, right? Maps are the most fundamental functions in programming. They should not be denigrated. They should be exalted, right? This is the first place to start. This is the simplest thing that you can do. There's no code associated with it. There's no categorical statements that need to be made about it. It's not like something of this mapping to something of that and the, the binding between two characters. It's like, no, it's, a, it's this set and that set. Right? An enumerated set is the simplest possible thing. A categoric set or a predicative set is a bigger you know, notion. So we can directly write these and we can directly invoke them. And everyone knows who works in Clojure the feeling of this. This is a big deal. 
All right. Records, fields, product types, the stuff you did before you did maps. Right? I will contend, even if they're immutable, this is still place-oriented programming. There's a place for the name. There's a place for the address. There's a place for the other thing. Right? Um, this is not a function anymore. And in general, because even when the fields are named, and sometimes they're not, right? if you just have raw product types, you've got no names. Uh, but even when the fields are named, so for instance, a Java class, you've got names for your, your fields. They're still not first class. Right? You, can't, you can't say, give me this object and this name, give me the thing. Right? You can, you can, obviously, you can use Java reflection and make six function calls to get the same effect. Uh, but it's not a, an invocable entity. So they're not functions. You don't get to use your information as a functional mapping. Uh, and a straight product type just completely complex the meaning of things with their position in a list. Now, I know Haskell has a record syntax, and I'm going to show that, so I'm not trying to say they don't have a way to put names on these things. Uh, but the fact is, you, know, you have to know the second string is different from the first string because I don't know what. It's not in the types. Uh, so this is place-oriented programming. And, and, and it matters, right, because what is the challenge of having a place? There always has to be something in the place, right? Now you, can, you know, there's, there's, a, there's this big difference between having places and therefore spaces and not. Uh, but, and of course, this is another thing we have to, you know, be defensive about. You know, at least these records, classes, whatever, uh, they enumerate what's possible, right? We're passing maps around as the Wild West, right? It could be anything. How do you know what it is? All I'm going to do is debug this thing forever. Maps are too open. There's no guidance. There's no delimiting thing. There's nothing that enumerates the possible herd. Um, but of course, that's true until you add spec, right? The, the idea is that spec is an orthogonal way to add that kind of communication, expression, validation, testing around uh, statements you would make about your aggregates. And then we have similar kind of stuff, right? Of course, it is not the same at all, right? What we have is RDF style, independent, reusable attributes, right? Especially when they're namespaced keywords. And we connect them to their range specifications. And they're, they, they're all by themselves until we go in a second step and we aggregate them and we say, let's take a set of those and name that. And that's our little herd or flock. We're going to group some of them together. And uh, I would like to call those aggregation schemas, right? They sort of imply a shape. And we'll talk a little bit more about that shape not just being a, always a list in a second. So that's how we, we can say, this is information about cars that, that travels together, right? Cars, uh, car is a spec, uh, or names a spec, uh, which is a key spec, which means it sort of describes the keys that could be present in a map, and this make, model, and year. Okay, so this gives us the same kind of ability to say there's a name for the, the herd and there are names for the things that could be part of the information that travels together. So we're sort of drawing a circle around a particular kind of shape or we're drawing a shape around a particular set of information. Um, so now we are at the core question. What do we do when some of the stuff uh, can be missing in a particular usage context? Right. Well, we sort of talked about this before. If we're dealing with maps and closure, what do we do? If, we're, if I don't have the, the street address for some user, what am I going to do? I'm just going to leave the key out. I'm going to leave it out of the set. And there's a tremendous benefit from that, because the thing is that in addition to being functions, the maps being functions, maps are also self-descriptive. Right? You can call keys on a map. Unlike a function, right? If you want to know what mapping does a function make between x and y, the categoric descriptions of it takes a string and returns a string, 
it actually doesn't really help you understand if I gave you this string, what string would I get? Categoric descriptions don't really tell you what's happening in the function. But maps as functions, you can do that. You can say exactly what things can you take, and keys tells you. Exactly what things can you return, vows tells you. So this enumerability is super important, which is why you don't want junk empty keys in your maps. You want to leave it out. That way the map can tell you, I do not know the last name or the address. I don't know that. The maps know what they know. That sheep is missing today. Well, it was sick, stayed in the barn, not out in the field. I don't have to worry about it. I'm not like, where is, you know, Fred Sheepy? You know, just not present. It doesn't help me. Now I'm anxious, right? Should I have Fred Sheepy? Uh, what about slots? Now you have a problem. Right? You have those boxes. We saw the sheep in the boxes, right? If you have places, you have to have something in the place, right? The, these languages pride themselves in like not having uninitialized memory, right? Because in the old C days, we could just like, you could just do nothing, you know, and have at it. When you try to touch it, you know, it will definitely blow up, like spectacularly. Uh, but in the area of like no uninitialized memory, then you have to have something to put there, which means now you have to, what are you going to put? You have, you know, you have a couple of choices. You have billion dollar mistakes, right, which they don't love. Maybe sheep, right? I, you know, so that's the thing. When you say maybe sheep, you know that that's not really a thing. <laughs> so how do we know it's not a thing? How do we get to it's not a thing? Well, I do think that the RDF people who are information representation experts who've been working on that problem for a long time really have good ideas. And I think their ideas about properties being independent and about making declarations about properties, about their ranges that are independent of how you might ever put them together with other properties to form any kind of aggregate is a completely sound one. Right? And when you do that, you realize that you would never say maybe anything. Because when you're talking about something in isolation, destined to be combined in myriad ways, in many different aggregates, to be part of many different herds, who, who knows that it's maybe, that you might not need it or, or, or will need it, definitely will need it. You can't decide then because you know this is a building block. And that's how you know maybe is not a good idea. Maybe types, and I don't care what they are, they're not really a great idea, especially maybe types now in slots. Because uh, the thing is, there's no such thing as a maybe thing, right? If, if, you're, if names are strings, names are always strings. You either know the name or you don't know the name. That's an orthogonal idea from what is a name. A name is a string. Knowing a name is a different idea. If type systems make you jam those two things together, they're wrong because they're separate ideas. We'd like to keep them separate, right? We're trying to use our programs to model the world and communicate with each other. And when we communicate with each other, you never say, I got six maybe sheep in my truck. <laughs> never, ever, <laughs> right? Nothing is inherently a maybe string. Um, so we don't want to do this. And you know, this is actually you know, sort of usage guidance. Right? We don't want to say that a thing is a nillable whatever, because we don't know where it's going to be used. We'd like that to be something that happens later. And it's part of the talk is to talk about this. So let's talk about how we do this then. Right? So I want to contrast these two things. So we have these ideas in both spaces. If you were doing it in Haskell, and this now shows the records in Texel, because they do have names possible. Um, it's just an alien, you know, it's just sugar over that product type I showed you before. Um, but we have the same idea. A make is a string. We have a car, has a make, uh, a model, and a year, and we're saying maybe it has a model and maybe it has a year. And in spec, we can say the same kind of thing. We say keys and we say we require the make and that the model and the year are optional. There's this word in your head, it's like, like the telltale heart, right? When? When, 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 when? 
we don't know the model in the year. When don't we know the model in the year? We don't give you the model in the year. When don't we give you the model in the year? We don't require the model. When don't we require the model? Who knows when? When does this say when? This doesn't say when. This says forever and ever and ever. Cars maybe have years and models. No, you know, there's a lot of times when they do have years and models, and there's other times when I don't care about the years and models, or I only care about the make and the model, but not the year. Right? Show me everything you know about Mustang, Ford Mustangs. Uh, so, this is a mistake. It's a mistake to put optionality in aggregate definitions. Right? There's no usage context. At least when you look at function arguments and returns, you're in a usage context. You're saying of function foo, it requires these arguments and it provides this return value. There's like a baked in context in the fact that you're talking about foo's arguments and foo's return. The context is when calling foo, this is required and that's not. Making an aggregate definition that you're going to use all over the place. It may be an argument sometimes. It may be a return sometimes. It may be arguments to five different functions that do different jobs. Uh, it's the wrong place for optionality. And I made the same mistake, right? I just showed you this, right? This is not better. This is the same problem. This is not closure being better than Haskell or Kotlin or Scala when you put maybe in, in the definition of a structure or record. This is the same problem. This is, there's no context here and optionality is context dependent. Um, so, you know, I know people have been wondering, oh, you know, where's spec? You know, it's like, when is it going to be finished or whatever? It's going to be finished, you know, when I figured this out, right? So last year, <laughs> last year, I, I had a pang. You know, I, I, I saw this, I had seen some people using it, I'd done more thinking about it, and I realized that this was not right. And I spent the last year, in addition to other stuff, like, you know, picking out this <laughs> scarf, uh, thinking about um, optionality and how it should work. Uh, and in particular, I, you know, I saw a lot of people struggling uh, trying to use spec. And you know, when I talk about some of the areas uh, in which things could be better, I think you'll all recognize how maybe they've been hard. Because a lot of times you just don't, you know, I gave it to you and it looked good. And it, it is good. I'm not saying it's bad, but it could be better, especially right in this area. So what do we want? So it's easy to say that things are wrong. Uh, what would be right? Uh, well, what we want is to maximize schema reuse. We want to maximize the reusability of the idea of a herd of information that represents a car. Right? That, that's the kinds of stuff we might think are interesting about cars include these things. And we're going to give that a name. That helps us communicate. It can help us validate things, it can help us check for errors, even before we get to optional requiredness, right, there's a lot we can do with that notion, right. The other thing that we want is we want to make sure that um, we don't have a proliferation of different schemas just because the contexts are different. My car for passing to foo, my car for passing to bar, my car that gets returned by Baz. We don't want that. What happens when you do that? Well, first of all, besides having a pro proliferation of types, which, how many people have worked in typed languages and had a proliferation of types? Yeah, I mean, it's like, what happens, right? Um, the problem with that is that's not really helping you. Those names don't help you, and they drive down the reusability of your consuming code. I write some, I write some code that you know, deals with my cars. Well, my code deals with my cars and your code deals with your cars. We don't have any code that deals with cars because we all had to make separate cars because we all had to make a car that had a different masking of optionality for use in a different context. Uh, so we don't want that. So we want to maximize the reuse of the idea of car or other schemas, other shapes. The shape is sort of a generic idea. It is not yet instantiated, right? A schema is a form for a model. It's not the thing, right? It's sort of like the outline of a thing form, you know, that's what schema means. Uh, we want to support a whole bunch of situations, and these are the situations I think uh, people have encountered, and see if you recognize them, in trying to apply 
uh, spec. For instance, there are many kinds of uh, APIs, especially wire protocols and things like that, that have symmetric uh, request response specifications from a schema standpoint. Give me a partially filled in form, I will give you back a more filled in form. Right? That's quite a common thing. Right? But with spec, if you had to say, well, the thing I require is you must give me the ID and the database something context, and what I provide will definitely include the names and phone numbers, but maybe not these other things, they became, they were forced to become two different specs, right? One was the spec for the, what you need to, what's required, and the other was the spec for what was provided. And everybody wanted to reuse the specs across those things, and they wrote really goofy predicates inside to try to reuse some stuff. Because what, the, what's the other problem with um, not being able to reuse? It's a recipe for error. If you have to define car and I have to define car, well, maybe you'll call it uh, make and model and maybe I'll call it brand and model. And now we've got no connection where we absolutely should have had a connection because we've had to restate the same ideas. Um, so that's a context. Another context which is quite common is a pipeline of information building, right? So you think about like, ring, you know, request chains and things like that, where each handler can sort of adorn the request with more information or to fill out default information, things like that, right? We have a bunch of handlers that work that way. Well, what would the spec be for each stage? Again, it's sort of like an explosion. What we want is the overall name for the idea of this herd is coming through, but, you know, the herd may start small and then, you know, I walk by with my sheep, I add it to the herd, and you add your sheep to the herd, and you, we're, we're acquiring information, right? Acquiring information should not be hard. And we were doing it already in Clojure, and Clojure programs are actually really good at both of these things, but spec wasn't as good as Clojure was in allowing you to talk about orthogonally the information set, the information schema, and the actual requirements and provisions of, for instance, stages in a, in a pipeline. How many people have felt tension applying spec in these kinds of contexts? Yeah, so eventually, you know, if you get to become, uh, you're doing more, you'll feel this more. Um, it's even harder than this, right? Because the thing is, uh, schemas nest, right? You can have a schema that is an aggregate, and one or more of the things in the aggregate are themselves aggregates. And this is where you truly realize that putting in aggregates is impossibly wrong, right? Because essentially, schema means shape. If I give you a schema that says A, B, C, D, and C and D are themselves X, Y, Z, Foo, Bar, Baz, what is the shape? It's not a four thing vector, is it? That shape described by that schema, which has pointers to other aggregates, describes a tree. The shape of the thing is actually a tree. And the thing you get past will be a tree. And the thing you return will be a tree. It's deep. And it means the optionality spec should be deep. Right? Because you can't talk, <laughs> you can't talk about a tree only by putting you know, annotations on the root. There's no place for it, right? If, if I said C has X, Y, Z and you need X, where are you gonna put that in a definition of, of the top? You can't. So we want it to be, we want it to be uh, deep. We want this to be deep. So the, you know, like all design things, this is just what was wrong. Two things were combined that shouldn't have been combined. Uh, and how do you fix it? You take them apart. The rest, this is all, this is all it is. The whole thing is this. You got a dictionary and the idea of like taking things apart and uh, you're done. <laughs> uh, so, so we have the, the talking about forms, right, is schema, right, just the overall shape. And then talking about subsets of the schema, subsets of the shape in context is selection. What things are we going to pick as being required or as being provided, right? 
And we do selections in context, and that gives us this orthogonality and two things we can combine. So let's look at how we would do this. All right, so we have the schema. This is shapes only. This is, you know, pseudo future code. Uh, and the idea here is that this doesn't apply required or optional at all. It's not what it's talking about. It's only talking about in this herd, we can have sheep and we don't have helicopters, you know. That's the idea. We're just talking about that. So we can have an idea of an address that has a street, a city, a state, and a zip. I'm not advocating any of these things as canonic, whatever, and I know zip codes are hard and blah, blah, blah. Um, so we say, you know, street describes its range, city describes its range, et cetera, et cetera. State has, you know, an arbitrary predicate. State codes, you know, they're a thing. Uh, zip code could be its own function, right? And then address is a schema that says, um, you could have streets or cities or states or zips in addresses. That's all it says. And that is a useful thing to be able to say and to name. And then we have a user. You know, we have a user in our system. People make systems with users all the time. And so uh, a user has an ID, a first name and last name, or can have an ID, a first name and a last name, and, uh, and an address. Right, so we're going to define new attributes for ID, first name, and last name, and then we're going to say user could have ID, first name, last name, or address, which was the, the other aggregate. So this describes a little tree. Now we have some imaginary usage context, right? So maybe we're building a system. We have users in a system, and our system uh, can uh, let you get movie times, and it lets you buy popcorn. Um, so get you movie times. Uh, in order to get, give you the movie times, I need or want to see your user ID and your zip code. That's all I need. I'm going to use that. I'm going to go find this stuff. So I want a user to be passed, but all I need to know about it are these two things. Now the user ID is up high in the root definition of user, but the zip code is an attribute of the address of a user inside a nested aggregate further down the tree. What about placing orders? Placing an order, uh, you know, I want to see your first and last name, and I'm going to ship it to you, so I need your whole address. Right? So these are both functions of users that have different requirements in different contexts. These are the kinds of things we want to model. The important thing is that there's no way, there's no optionality spec at the top level that can represent saying these things. This, you can't say it, which means nobody can say it. We just had a GraphQL talk. Guess who can't say it? <laughs> yeah. But you'll be the first to be able to say it. This will be awesome. So what, how will this work? Well, well and again, this is, this is like not syntax yet. Uh, but imagine you could say um, that, the, that the spec for user will be this selection. It'll say from from the herd user, from the shape, the schema user, I'm interested and I must have the ID and the address. And of the address, I need the zip code. Right? And then to place an order, we're saying, again, I'm interested in user information here. This is what I'm expecting to see. Uh, and I need the first and last name and the address. And from the address, I need the whole thing, street, city, state, and zip. Right? This select notion is a, is a deep requirements thing. If you've ever used atomic pull, this should smell like some pizza, right? It's a, it's a similar pizza. It's a, you, know, you need a language for talking about trees and, uh, and recursion and things like that. So this separates requiring the attribute from the requirements of an attribute. You saw address and then zip of address. That seems like, oh, why do I have to say that? It's just like four more characters. You know, like, this is so hard. Um, but it ends up they're different things, because there are definitely contexts in which you say, addresses are optional, but if you give me an address, you have to give me a whole address. Right? Those are two different ideas. I need an address, or I don't need addresses, but when you give me addresses, I need this part. Those are two separate things, so they're said separately. Um, in this in this model, uh, does that make sense? Okay. Um, 
And this allows you to spec into members of the collections, right? Because that's what you need. What you're actually accepting as an argument is a tree implied by the schema. It's the whole tree. The context uh, specifications you need to supply have to be about the whole tree. Um, because otherwise, how are you going to compose this? If you need like different fractions of addresses in different contexts, I mean, think about the explosion, right? The combinatorial explosion of root things with different kinds of nested things so that the roots could have the right stuff. Like, you just can't do this job on the aggregates themselves. You have to be able to talk about the trees. Um, this, it just took a long time to figure out. Um, the other thing that this will be able to do, I'm not showing on the slide, is to spec into members of collections. So sometimes you'll say, uh, the spec for something will be, uh, I have, uh, I have friends, and then friends is a collection of, friend, of person, and persons have whatever. And so you want to be able to say, of every friend you're telling me about, for each friend, I need this information. So to be able to spec not only into nested uh, schemas, but also nested collections of things. So you will be able to talk down into nested schemas as well as each member of a nested collection. Um, this is the kind of power you need to apply spec really everywhere because uh, obviously function in, data in and out is one thing and it gets pretty, it gets pretty uh, complex uh, but you know, people are, how many people use spec for like wire stuff and APIs and things like that? I mean, it's definitely intended to be used there. That's part of the value proposition of it. Those kinds of things definitely need this kind of stuff. Uh, so I'm, I'm really happy about being able to go there. Uh, what about this? Is this saying anything? I'm not, you're not forcing me to do anything. Like, where, where's the fun in that? You know, what's, what are the points of types if you're not forcing something? Right? Well, there, there are two good reasons. I mean, so anyway, this is going to be okay. You're just saying what I expect to see is user information. Right? And the, the thing also to remember about these um, selects, this is just minimal requirements. You can always have more stuff. You can have way more stuff coming in. There may be more stuff coming back. And there may be stuff not in user. Right? Spec is an open system. Having more is OK. I am not going to help you write closed, brittle, breaking systems. I'm not going to do it no matter how much you complain on Twitter. It's not going to happen, <laughs> right? It, it's just not going to happen. So this is like minimal requirements, minimal provision. It's not a boundary around things. Um, so saying this just says, I have an expectation of, of seeing user data, stuff from the user flock. I want to see sheep. I don't want to see helicopters. Uh, or I, I can't do anything with helicopters. I'm expecting sheep. Um, you could send me a helicopter. Maybe my job is to pass it along to the, the next thing, which is going to airlift the sheep to somebody else. That's not what I do, but they do it. You know, I, I think that that's an important part of making flexible systems, that you could flow information through things that just don't even know it's happening. That's important. right? That's how transportation networks are built. You can't not have that. You can't have trucks that only hold certain kinds of things that run on roads that only hold trucks of certain kinds of things. That's not, the, the world doesn't work that way. So why would you say something like this? Well, it helps you communicate, right? The user gets a sense of like, what am I supposed to pass, right? Or what will I get? And it will help us with test generation, right? Your function does expect to see user data. I will generate tests that give you user data. And in this case, you know, various random subsets of anything that a user could, you know, is implied by user deeply down the tree. But you already do the trees and all that, that work. And that's another part of what, why this makes sense, right? When we generate user stuff, we don't generate roots only. We generate trees, right? We go down into the nested specs. And if they're collections, we generate down into those. This, this lack of symmetry between selection and generation was, you know, that was, it was a, a warning sign. Uh, so, whoa, is that like super tiny? It doesn't really matter. It's, ex it's exactly what I was talking about before, so you don't need to read the text in, in, the, in the boxes. This is still the same 
users and addresses uh, and whatnot. But what I'm trying to show here is the split, right? We start with RDF style attribute, you know, and they map to RDF properties, uh, definitions that describe their own ranges. They're just floating around, waiting to be gathered up in herds and herded around in your programs. And you can gather them up, and of course that creates other attributes which point to the, the gatherings, right, the, the aggregates. Um, but we're going to call those schemas. They still do not have any uh, requirement provision subsetting. And then finally we have selections, which you'll tend to use only at the edges of usage contexts. Right? It's unlikely, although it will not be impossible, um, for you to make you know, um, name specs that point to selections, uh, but I will probably prohibit nested selections, because then you're just back to the thing I just fixed. You know, like I, I want to let you make that and do it to yourself. Um, but it would, it would fall out of this being fully general that you could. So we'll probably close that door. Um, and so, yeah, so now you have these separate ideas, which are the way you think about things anyway, and now you get to say, the th you know, say it the way you think about it. And uh, this is going to make uh, systems a lot more uh, reusable um, and extensible, right? That's part of the idea of spec, is that you can make systems that you can change, that you can enhance over time. That is, that is the game. Saying today you could do X or Y, it's not enough. Every program changes, every program grows. You need the ability to talk about type-like things in ways that are compatible with program evolution. That's the idea behind spec. Um, so, so this is coming, this, you know, of all the things we were working on, this one uh, was least far along uh, by, by Kanj, but this is the next thing coming in spec. Uh, it will eventually replace keys, but you can, you know, these are obviously two different names, so there may be a migration world where you know, all three names exist. Uh, we also have been working on better programmatic manipulation of specs, if anybody's looking at Alpha 2. Um, this is a pretty cool system, I think, for defining macros on top of multi-methods, which now gives us a sort of intermediate step that's program accessible, that doesn't involve generating the shape of a macro form and evaling it because I know a lot of people want to write programs that write specs. Um, that, that has room to grow more, but I mean, the underpinnings are in that system. Also, it's a cool system to make extensible macro libraries, so have a look. Um, and other things I've been thinking about uh, have been refining the function specs. So I'm, of course, very wary right now about any other type system-y gook getting into a spec. And uh, the next thing I was going to work on a year and a half ago in spec was uh, you know, trying to refine the idea of the return specs. Uh, I know people are struggling to say, it takes you know, a collection of x and returns a collection of x. This kind of thing you would say with parameterized types, right? right? The, the amazing type, you know, uh, type signature for reverse. You know, it takes a list of A and returns a list of A. Uh, and the problem is when A is predicative, uh, that's harder to say, but there's a bigger problem. It's pointless to say that. That's not something you want to say. L that, that reverse takes a list of A and returns a list of A, it doesn't communicate anything about re what reverse does. If, if I asked you what reverse did and you told me that, I would not be happy. Right? If you needed to implement reverse and I told you that, you would not be happy. Right? Because it doesn't communicate anything. What do you want to say about reverse? At least you want to say it reverses the list it was given. So if that list was all of strings, what could you possibly derive using like the most basic logic about the return if what you said was the stuff that was in the collection that came in? Well, you'd know if that was all strings that the, it would return all strings. The categoric declaration of that is almost information free. You almost always want your return specifications to be dependent on your arguments. In other words, 
the fun specs. The fun specs are the real deal. Um, because you can derive the trivialities from that, but it also means that you don't need something like uh, parameterization to say, I take a collection, that's, you know, I don't care what it is, but it will satisfy some set of predicates. If I could say I return that same stuff or a subset of the stuff that you gave me, you would know those same predicates applied, right? You could use logic to do that. You wouldn't need some icky category uh, language to talk about return types because it doesn't, it doesn't really say what's happening at all, right? The fact that you return the same stuff or a subset of the stuff says way more. And of course, then you could do more with spec. You could start talking about like what reverse actually does. What are the properties of the reverse thing compared to the incoming thing? You know, what did reverse do? Which is what fun specs uh, allow you to say. So I'm, I'm starting to smell ret in fun specs, uh, but I want to make it um, concise to sort of do something without having to fully define your fun spec because sometimes that's a challenging thing to do, right? But the fact is, if you could just say returns the same, the stuff from the collection it was given, you'd be saying more than type systems let you say. And if you can't say everything about the nature of your algorithm and all the transformations, it's okay. You're still adding value, you're still adding rigor to your system, and you're still helping people understand what it does. Maybe it's a combination of a partial specification of the, of the result and documentation that helps them totally put it together. Um, which is another thing I would just sort of say generally about spec is uh, there's often a desire to like completely nail everything down. That's not necessary in a lot of cases. There's a spectrum of what you can communicate, what's straightforward to communicate, and what isn't. And all along that spectrum, pretty much after the very first step, you're saying more than type systems ever let people say. And you're letting things be tested in an automatic way more than you were ever getting. Um, so don't go crazy if you can't completely spec the entire nature of your inner algorithm, um, because sometimes it's challenging. Other things about making return types uh, talk about the inputs is that a lot of people in spec are struggling with talking about functions that um, rely on external state. Reifying external state as an additional input, which is what it is, is another thing that I've been thinking about. So that's really future thinking kind of stuff. But the important thing is I have been working on spec. New things are coming. Uh, they're going to make spec better. We're extremely sensitive to breaking programs that use spec and making the transition of closure, closures use of the current spec to the next spec uh, straightforward. So like we're thinking about those things and we're working on it. And uh, that's it.